Katie, why did you bring me my Christmas present tonight? Because I haven't seen you since Christmas. <laughs> like, and I even remembered it. I ran back. <laughs> uh, you need a microphone. No, I talk really loud. <laughs> uh, welcome to the, the inaugural 2020 issue of Black Man Beyond. Hi. My name is Mark Bernard, and I am joined by just awesomeness. Like, fuck, I feel... <laughs> Whatever. Like, it's Katie Sackhoff and Trisha Helfer here, you guys. Uh, so, so, Trisha was supposed to be on before, if some of you guys remember. Um, and, and I then, flaked at the last moment. She, you didn't flake, you were deathly, deathly ill. Yes. And, uh, and you were like, I can't make it. Uh, and I said, oh, all right, then I guess we'll just cancel the show. And she said, but no, but wait, <laughs> Katie's going to come. And I said, oh, shit, all right, <laughs> Katie's going to come. And, Katie and she went, is she sober now? Don't worry about it. And you're like, oh, God. I was like, we're at a bar. Is this okay? <laughs> um, but Katie came and she killed it. And then uh, Trisha's like, but I want to come and do it now. And so now we're all doing a show. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> How are you guys? How was your New Year's? How was your holidays? How was your Christmases? Your Hanukkahs? Your Kwanzaa's? <laughs> All of it. <laughs> we celebrated everything. All at once. Um, I was in bed at 10.15 on New Year's. Were you? And I'm never in bed at 10.15. Like a baller. Like, on a regular day. No, it's so. true. You stay, you fall asleep on the couch a lot. Yeah. And yeah. It, yeah. So I was, a, I was very lame on New Year's Eve, but um, you got to do that every once in a while. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we were, my boyfriend and I were, we went out to dinner early. We couldn't get a reservation, so we were like, let's just go at five. <laughs> <laughs> we were like done with dinner at like 7.45 and like came home. So and you did like, the senior special too. We did, it was amazing. And it was really great. And then we were laying in bed watching Rick and Morty. <laughs> And the only reason we knew it was New Year's was we heard a bomb go off and like the, the chihuahua was like, ah! And then he <laughs> leaned over and goes, Happy New Year, baby. <laughs> oh, Happy New Year. And that was it. And then yeah. we went back to Rick and Morty. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I How was, was yours? I was surrounded by a flock of like 80-year-old Irish people. Um, but not like fun Irish, just like New Jersey Irish. <laughs> so basically just drunk people. I was um, going to ask. Yeah, just like banging pots, because apparently that's a thing that they do when the it's Irish New Year's. The Irish get weird. I, I thought you were going to stop up. at banging. Just banging. I mean, a bunch of 80-year-olds having an orgy. There's, there's, there's like, a lot of creaking somewhere later at night. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. There was, ironically, a pot. There was, so it was really weird. Pot. Someone brought out a... Just like chattering teeth, dentures that went loose. Um... So it was kind of awful, but hey, New Year's. But I did, uh, the thing I did the day, New Year's Day, I went to go see, uh, I was in New York, I went to go see the Rockettes, the Radio City Rockettes. Have you ever done this? No, but that is just, I mean, it's so iconically Christmas. It's bonkers. It is the weirdest fucking form of entertainment I've ever seen, which is, hey, you know what's cool? Legs. I know, right? But you know what's even cooler? Like 40 pairs of them moving at once, doing like with no story around it, just we're gonna march out here, we're gonna put our arms around each other and just kick for a while. And people pay Could money you for this. Imagine if someone accidentally ran out of stage <laughs> and they just didn't stop their choreography and just no. kept kicking the shit out of someone. What's wrong with Mildred? I don't know. She's so fucking angry. And like it's it's not even dance really because it's like it's just it's like watching a, an air show. It's like half military procession. It totally is. Yep. <laughs> but then they wrap like this weird bullshit Christmas story around it, where first it's hey let's go for a tour of New York on this bus driven by rockets, and then you're on like this bus that's just kind of like hey look it's a Statue of Liberty, and, and then you get on like Santa. <laughs> it's like pornos that started like that. I mean, <laughs> this would have been like way more interesting if anything else happened. And then they're like, they give you 3D glasses, and I'm like, why do we need 3D glasses? There's girls on the stage, it's all 3D. But then they're like, no, we're taking you on like a VR tour of New York. So then you're in like Santa's sleigh, and you put on these glasses, and then it's this bullshit, like really badly animated version of like a tour of New York. And then camels are on stage because the three wise men are like walking across the stage. And you know who plays the wise men? Rockettes. <laughs> Like how, why, 
Who thought this was a good idea? Now, are their legs showing? The theater. No men. No men at all. Are their legs showing when they're playing the wise men? No, because of God. Oh. <laughs> so they were like, no, no, this is the classy part. And then Santa comes out. Because shit all everywhere. Fuck yeah. And then like Santa comes out and he talks to these two like immigrant kids who are like, I gotta buy a present for my sister. Let's go to the North Pole. And there's 40 Santas at the North Pole. They're all rockets. <laughs> but like every 18 minutes, there's a reason for like the rockets to come out and kick a lot. And I'm like, but how, when did this ever be entertainment? Like 1932 where it's like, guys, it's been a long, uh, we lost a lot of money in the stock market crash. You know what I could really do right now? <laughs> Fucking legs, right? <laughs> yeah, legs make everything better, but like, what are they gonna do? Kick a lot? Wasn't it, <laughs> didn't the Rockettes perform a lot for the troops? I feel in, like, like it's the, a, like, USO thir- stuff. Yeah, but like really, like in, during like World War II and stuff. Uh, I would guess that there were like eight rockets they put on a plane. <laughs> and, like, took to, <laughs> just <laughs> dropped them out the plane. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's like, dive, 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 dive. <laughs> legs, bitch, legs. <laughs> <laughs> they won't shoot the legs. <laughs> uh, so that was my New Year's. <laughs> it was like, this is weird and like, Kind of crazy objectification, but for kids. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would have loved to have been at that ta- that round table of like, ladies, how do we stay current? <laughs> yeah. I know. Camels. Really though? And 3D's they, big. And they have live fucking camels who walk out on the stage. Live camels. Live camels. Yeah. Yeah. Peter's gonna have a field day. Just. That's what the legs are for. <laughs> Kicking away the pita. <laughs> no, Lord. So yeah, that, that was my holiday. And I, and I saw some movies. Did you guys watch any like Oscar movies? Because the Oscar nominations. I think two. Yeah. Three. What? Which ones? 1917. Mm. Okay. Joker. Mm. Uh-huh. And Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh yeah, I've seen some too then. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're talking about then. Fuck yeah, I've seen some shit. I don't know. Who's nominated? Uh, I mean, I haven't seen 1917. 1917? 1917. Yeah. Okay, good. It's really good. <laughs> it's really good. It, no, I've heard it's amazing. I just like... I loved it. I yeah. just, I need to go. You need to go. You need to see the movies. Yes. Have you guys seen the 1917 yet? Um, I will spoil one thing. We win the war. But, okay. <laughs> no, I'll spoil another thing, is that the conceit of the movie is that it's all one shot, right? Yes. Like, it's, it's sort of, I know, it's crazy. I mean, it's not really one shot. But that's the, but like, it's, it's built as if it's a one So yeah. you're li- literally just following these two guys as they're on this mission to, like, we got to bring these orders to the front lines to stop a giant attack. And I spent the first, like, ten minutes, like, looking for the cuts. Yeah, and then you get tired of looking yeah, for the cuts. Yeah, like, ooh, they walked through the door. That's a fucking cut right there. It's like, ooh, there's some shit. They cut it right it there. It kind of like, gets dark there, so that's a cut. Yeah, it's totally a fucking cut. But then after a while, you just, like, you get hypnotized by it, and you're just like, I'm in the story. I'm in the movie. And, uh, and the filmmaking is just ridiculous. It's brilliant. You know, yeah. coincidentally, mm-hmm. on the way here, I got in my car, and on the radio was the co-writer, Christy. Ooh. Um, talking to whatever station it was on um, mm. about writing that. Mm. And she was saying, sort of like with tension, one of the things that they ha- she was paying attention to, they were paying, her and Sam were paying attention to, was in these one-shot type movies, which are, yes. she didn't have any really reference to go off of, was sort of like when there's too much tension or something, something breaks the ice or something makes you laugh to mm. kind of break the tension, give the audience the time, time to breathe. And she said when they were writing that, they were concerned about that, but due to the one-shotness of it, that if the audience is like too much kind of going along with it, they had to break up mm-hmm. a little bit of, with a, a story, like a little bit less action, a little bit less, you know, are they gonna get shot, are they gonna get shot? But also with the dialogue, not just with the action. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's gorgeous. There's, there's a sequence in there that, t- it, you know, it's, it's a day pretty much in this guy's life as he's going from one place to another. And so at night, there's a sequence in this bombed out village and there are like flares going overhead and the shadows just like marching across the frame. It's just, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen where people also die in it. They had to do it with wires, right? And take out the wires. 
Yeah, the flares they had were on wires. They weren't just shooting flares. And oh, you mean for the camera? For stuff? the camera, yeah. There was, there's, a bunch, there's a great making of thing that's on YouTube now. Oh, so you can is? see how they do it. And so a lot of it's handheld. And then they're putting the camera on a crane. And then the crane is taking it. And then they're taking it off the crane and putting it on a rig on a motorcycle. And a dude's driving it. Like, that's it's crazy. fucking nuts. I think they should win just for the feet of it alone. Yeah, most movie, uh, 1917. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. I haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> oh, I will do. I saw the Mr. Rogers movie, uh, Beautiful How Day in the that? Neighborhood. A lot of people were slightly disappointed, because, not be, with the movie, but because it was something different than they thought it was going to be. Yeah, they thought they were going to get like a Mr. Rogers <laughs> biopic. And what you get is this story about a journalist who was assigned, and he's like a kind of war correspondent, like a political journalist, who was assigned a profile of Mr. Rogers. And in doing so, it reveals the many and varied ways this guy's broken. Like his relationship with his father, his relationship with his wife, with his kid. Like he's just, he's a he's an unsettled soul, and how interacting with Fred Rogers kind of puts him back on the path. But there's a part in that movie that it's in the trailer, so I'm not spoiling anything, where Mr. Rogers is on the subway, and he's sitting there talking to this guy, and the kids on the subway are like, "Hey, Mr. Rogers," and you're like, "Are they gonna mug Mr. Rogers?" <laughs> but then they start singing the theme song, and like. It is the most pure, beautiful thing like I've ever seen. Like, and I'm just like, oh, he's just he's singing to sing it them, and they all know the words, and it's lovely, and it's like, everything's great. I know it's all great. It's the most beautiful scene I've ever seen this year. <laughs> but yeah, I was a mess, like crying like a baby. It's it's um. I, watching Tom Hanks at uh, the Golden Globes inspired me to like go back and watch some of his movies that I absolutely like adored over mm. the years. And then we just watched Philadelphia, and like I've, I've seen the movie many, many times, so you know what's coming. And then I get to the end, and it's like the last, you know, that scene with with um, Tom Hanks and and um, Antonio Banderas. It's like the very end when he looks at him and says, "I'm ready now," or "I'm ready to go," and you think. Oh, does he want to go home? <laughs> oh, no. Because <laughs> it's, it's such a sweet way that he said it. He says it in such a, like, I'm ready to go. And you're like, oh, cool. Oh, no. no. And then I blubber for, like, mm. like <laughs> at one point I was like... <laughs> 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 and Robin was like, are you okay, babe? I was like, <laughs> but he was, like, in a really nice way, like, consoling me. Cause I was like, <laughs> ready to go now. <laughs> Yeah. With taking it back to Mr. Rogers, mm -hmm. um, do you think I've I've never seen anything? I, I didn't grow up watching, you know, anything with Mr. Rogers. Did you uh, guys not have Mr. Rogers in Canada? I didn't have a TV. That's right. So you grew up in the Stone Age. I go. I grew up in the Stone Age. <laughs> would I have the same kind of nostalgia to like that scene, per, for instance, or um, the the movie? Would it? impact me the same? I mean, like the, movie, the movie does a decent job of explaining why he was as special as he was. It is not quite as good as the documentary that came out last year called Won't You Be My Neighbor, which is like literally just archival footage and like he's passed away so you can't talk to him anymore. But it does a better job of telling the Mr. Rogers story and why he was so special and so amazing. But it's the, the, the thing that always gets me, my weakness, my soft spot, is for a life's work recognized. And that's that moment where like, he just did this thing every day for like 40 years because he loved it. And to watch the, the response of the world to him just walking through it, I was just a fucking mess. I get my mom is next to me. I took the screener back home and I'm sitting on the couch. Like, my mom's here, my wife's there, my son's there. And I'm just a wreck. I'm like, what's the matter? So, did you see that? It's just, just everybody's singing this song. Why are you not crying? <laughs> No? No. No. Oh. Because I come from a family of robots. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on Mr. Rogers. I loved every aspect of the show. That and Captain Kangaroo. Oh. No well, one? that guy's a deviant. He's yeah. a deviant. I mean... I don't know, because we weren't allowed to watch Pee-wee. <laughs> we, we turned on an episode of Pee-wee's Playhouse one time, and it just happened to be the episode where he had this large pair of underpants on his head. And my, my family was very, I grew up very Christian, and my mom just came in and went, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so we were never allowed, because my mother was like, he's a pedophile. And we were like, no, he's not. <laughs> What's a pedophile? <laughs> Your mom was in on the joke. 
He's like, <laughs> he's a, fuck, you're right. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> didn't see that coming. I know. I didn't, yeah, it's fine. Um, and the last one that I saw on the plane was Booksmart. Have you oh, Booksmart's Book Smart? amazing. Oh, it's so lovely. You didn't watch it? I haven't I seen it. You want, I thought you even saw that. No. Oh. I don't so even good. know what it's about. Um, oh, Olivia it, Wilde. Olivia Wilde directed it. Ah. Um, and it's about these two, these two girls in high school. They're about to graduate. And they spent their entire high school career focused, like hyper-focused on their studies, to the detriment of everything else in their lives. And so they decided on this last day of high school that they were just going to fucking go for it. They had spent four years being like, nerds, and now they were going to be awesome. And following their like crazy, like, one last night kind of riot trip is lovely. But it's so precisely observed about the lives of these two girls and how they relate with each other and relate with the world and relate with their peers and the love they have for each other and how that love is kind of colored and a little lopsided to a certain degree. And it's, it's so clear-eyed about gender and sex and, and orientation. And, it, and there's a moment in the, towards the end of that movie that is the most, second most beautiful thing I've seen. It's just she dives into a pool. And it means everything at that moment when she just like, I'm going for it. And I was like, oh, wow, I wish I was like a teenage girl right now because I would feel everything. <laughs> that was the worst part about being a teenage girl, by the way. Just feeling everything all the everything. time. Everything. <laughs> all the time. It never stopped. Mm. Yeah, being a teenage boy was also awful because you felt nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this so stupid? I thought that that, did you think that that movie was just a, too long? I feel like most comedies are a, too long. Yeah. Like it's a little Apatow that way. Where it's yeah. Like, oh, dude, you could have pulled 40 minutes out of this is yeah. 40. It's like three false endings. <laughs> yeah. Like that, just one of these. Pick one. Anyone will do. Um, I was upset, however, when I saw the Oscar nominations that, uh, that there was no love for Booksmart at all. Mm. It was, uh, it was, uh. It was a relatively disappointing Oscar season. I you. didn't even see who was nominated. Um, <clears throat> uh, I will give you a hint. Mm. Everybody's white. Uh, and most people are men, apparently. Almost everybody. Like, there is no women who directed any movies. Oh, my God, we've come so far. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Progress. Yeah. <laughs> Marches on. We. <Whee>! Yay. <laughs> um, the, only, the only person of color in the acting categories at all was Cynthia Erivo for Harriet. From Harriet, right. Um, which, I mean, she's great. The movie's interesting. But it's very telling that the only black actress who could be nominated was nominated for playing a slave. And it's like, you know, there's lots of other things that uh, lots of other actresses have done mm. this year. I mean, Alfre Woodard still doesn't have an Oscar, and she's just playing a lady who does some shit and does it awesome. <sighs> Scarlett Johansson got nominated twice. <laughs> yeah, because she's twice In as the white. Same. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lee, Lee, because she's twice what? She's twice as white. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Everybody. Um, listen. Supporting and lead. For the same movie? <laughs> she had uh, for the so, same movie? No. Supporting for Jojo, Jojo Rabbit, Rabbit. And lead for Marriage, Marriage Story. Story. Oh. Yeah. So, hey, listen. I, a lot of the movies that <clears throat> came out were really good and really interesting, but... I didn't it, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I didn't like it either. I thought it was, Me three. I thought it was... <laughs> <laughs> I watched it completely <laughs> confounded. Like, what yeah. is... <clears throat> I mean, it's shot I thought it was pretty, pointless. But what's the point? <laughs> hmm? Boom. Quentin I mean, hype. It's, it's Quentin. Quentin is the most indulgent filmmaker working, and sometimes that indulgency pays off. Like I really liked Inglorious Bastards. Great. I really didn't care for Hateful Eight, and like, discrete scenes in this movie are interesting. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's doing really good work, but it just for me it never added up to a story that felt like it had any energy or propulsion right. or leading anywhere. Yeah, I and thought she, Margot Robbie was completely wasted in that movie, and then celebrated for it. It was strange. She's nominated. For that? Yeah. No yeah, good. <laughs> oh no, for bombshell, sorry. Yes. Oh, for bombshell. <laughs> for like, bombshell. I'm gonna go crawl into my rock if I know nothing, <laughs> I guess. What the hell is this garbage? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was uh, I was a little underwhelmed. But yeah, it's one of those every year's different. There are some years where it feels as if we are making some progress and some sense of parody that oh yeah, there are actually people beyond the standard who are making stuff. And like the fact that Little Women didn't get much of anything, I'm like, guys, it's fucking Little Women. The fact that Hustlers didn't get anything, yeah. I'm like, guys, 
did you see fucking JLo's ass? She's 50 years old. The amount of work you put in to like fucking do that shit? God. Just give her the Oscar. Just give her the just fucking Oscar. bounce it off her stomach. Boing. <laughs> <laughs> It'll inspire everyone. Um, like Eddie Murphy was amazing in Dolomite. Right. And like no love for Eddie Murphy. It was just one of those like, all right, I guess it's going to be like it used to be. Yeah, I mean, I, listen, it's, it's such a strange thing to comment on when, you know, I grew up looking like so many people that are in these categories, you know, and so I feel like I am not necessarily entitled to an opinion, you know. However, I do think that the underrepresentation of women in, in film as far as the directing category is, is appalling. I think that we've got so many amazing female writers and and directors that are that are um, underappreciated and at working twice as hard to get the opportunities, and I think that's really disappointing. I read something that the the thought is that a lot of the academy that are making the decisions aren't necessarily um, <laughs> not voting for; it's they're not watching the movies, so it's not even on their radar in terms of being able to vote for them or choose. I heard Lupito, I haven't seen the movie, but she did amazing in some movie that she did. Yeah, she was in Us. And but I'm, I'm ambivalent about the movie. The performance is really strong, but there's a vast swath, you're right, of the, voter sh the, the viewership, the voter body of the Oscars who just were never going to watch that movie. You know, they're never going to watch The Farewell to know that Aquafina is as good as she is. They're never going to watch Little Women. stunning. Her performance was just like... Yeah. Amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. And so it's, I think you're right, it's the, it's the diversifying the, the body of the Academy will help to diversify the kinds of movies that that body watches that then gets to vote on. And so they're trying, they're doing their best. How but, big is the Academy, do you know? Um, I think it's something like 13, 1,400 900? people? 900 total. But the, cl the class last year was the biggest they'd ever had, which was like 535 people were What's, admitted into the academy. What is the diversity like inside of the academy? It is overwhelmingly uh, male, it's overwhelmingly old, and it's overwhelmingly white. It's all like over 50 is the average age. Um, something like 70% male and 90% Do white. Do like they never get kicked out? Is it like bad teachers? Uh, <laughs> like about tenure? Yeah. Um, I remember like when I was in Entertainment it, Weekly, right? we wrote a story about um, Ron Howard's Apollo 13 Oscar campaign. Mm. And because he comes from a long like Hollywood family, one of his first stops was always the retirement home because there's a bunch of old actors and writers and directors who never drop out of the Academy, who are all like haven't worked in 20 some odd years, and like, hey, I made a movie just for you guys. It's a bunch of astronauts doing really? cool astronaut shit. Is there legitimacy to this story? Yeah. Like it's actually... It's actually a thing. Like, and it, it has become a whistle stop on the Oscar campaign tour of, we gotta go to the old folks home, we gotta talk to the, the retirees, we gotta, because they are the largest voting bloc. Nothing against old people. No, I love old people. Especially when they have lots of sex at New Year's Day. <laughs> but Way to bring pots. that back around. But pots and chattering teeth. It is a little strange, though, that the Academy is not an accurate representation of the viewing body of the entire country. It feels like it should be, huh? Yeah. Hmm. It's not, though. But they don't have a host this year again, right? No host. They're just uh, they're hostless. Flying blind. Hostless. I thought Ricky Gervais was awesome, though. <laughs> so amazing. Uh, we were dying laughing. <laughs> we were dying so hard. I snorted so hard in Rob and my boyfriend's ear that he was like, "Oh my God, babe!" Ow, <laughs> laughing looked, so hard. We we saw it with a bunch of Battlestar people. It was Michael Trucco and his wife and James Callis and us and Charn and a bunch of us. Yeah. And they, I wasn't there. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not in the family, so that's fine, but just saying. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but we were all laughing so hard at, that I actually at one point looked over and James's kids were all looking at the adults like... <laughs> we were all laughing, like mm -hmm. snorting. Like and the kids, really the kids didn't think it was as funny as we did. But I loved every second of it. Um, <laughs> Baby I, Yoda Joe Pesci. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I got to watch it after the fact because I wasn't invited to a cool party. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I appreciate the, the Ricky Gervais of it all, but I'm always a little suspect of it because 
he is as much a part of that community as anybody else. And for that, the weird slight like holier than thou, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you as if it's not also what's wrong with him. It's always a little like, dude, like you work but for But doesn't Netflix. he own that too though? You would know it though. Like watching that monologue, mm. it's, it, it never, it always feels as if he's chastising an industry for the things they do wrong, of which he is firmly a part, who does the same things wrong. It's funny, but I'm like, uh, uh. He has acknowledged that in his tweets. He's like, look, I'm the biggest left liberal there is, but mm. a joke is a joke. But you're right, he did skewer everybody, he did. which he's a part of. You're right. Um, but uh, good for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Getting paid to do the same thing every four or five years. I'm like, I'm going to be bad, you guys. Just you wait. I'm going to drink up there. I'm going to tell these fucking stars that they're morons. Now, Again. I wonder if he's like, like the after party, if he goes or if he's just like, right. I'm going to go back to my hotel room. I don't think I'm going to be really welcome there yeah, tonight. Like the, the Straight through mobile. the TSA line home. <laughs> Tangling. <I'm> done. <laughs> um, well, I think that with our talk about the Oscars, we have segued officially into the news, you guys. We're going to talk about some news. Woo-hoo! News. I canceled my cable, so... Did you? Uh, but yeah, so I don't know. Not that that's news. <laughs> <laughs> I just meant I don't watch it anymore, so whatever news I get, I'm getting from Twitter. <laughs> Excellent. It's probably uh, more reliable, I feel, than most news. <laughs> some of it is. <laughs> it's um, more current. The Television Critics Association uh, winter session is going on in Pasadena, and if you don't know what that is, that is when the networks sort of parade their upcoming wares and decide to make a ton of announcements, and they bring out the cast of their new shows, and so we're in that, we're catching that wave of announcements. And the one that I found most interesting is that uh, CBS is making a Clarice Starling show. Clarice. Clarice. Um, which takes place after Silence of the Lambs, but before... Um, the other movies, and it's like her sort of first year as a full-fledged uh, FBI agent. Um, I know, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> Bullshit. Tell me you're not lying. It's, it's for real, though. Um, Hannibal Lecter's not expected to be in said TV show. I think they're, they're, they'll probably save that, I think, for, like, sweeps. <laughs> like, who? Guess who's coming to dinner? Who is it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, are, are you, uh... <laughs> my chihuahua that... makes that exact same face when he licks my pug's vagina. What? <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, I didn't... Whoa, you, I didn't hear the beginning of Everyone's that. Everyone's an adult here. Yeah, yeah, but I just want to diagram that My chihuahua... That okay. ...like, gets up in my other... You know, it's how they say hello. <laughs> and every time he does it, he goes away like this. <laughs> It's so gross. I don't know why I just thought of this, but I saw a picture of Sarah Silverman today that she posted where she's, she's got her legs spread. She's sitting there, like, sitting up, got her legs spread, and she's got, holding her iPhone in front of her uh-huh. crotch. And you look, and you're like, oh, that's a... And then you zoom in. Of course, we all... And how many... Who have you done... And I digress. Um, anyway, it's, it's a picture of a man's mouth sideways with big lips, and all you see... At first glance, all you see is two pink It things. looks like her vagina. And then, and then you zoom in, and there's like, there's like whiskers and a mustache around it and a beard. You're like, how, how did you even think of that? Like, I mean, it's kind of funny. It's but pretty brilliant. Anyway, sorry to, to die. No, I feel like I've sorry. lost control of this show in the best way. <laughs> what did you think was going to happen when we're in a I mean, It has was, nothing to do with Clarice, but. I, I was still trying she to figure out. Though your crazy freaky dog sex house. <laughs> it's like, my chihuahua is going to town on my bug. <laughs> well, not so much. We put her in a kennel now when we leave because he can't be trusted. She tore her, a- her ACL, and we think it's because she was trying to get away from him when we were gone. <laughs> or just bending in the wrong way while they were still there. <laughs> like, put that leg where I like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, Clarice Starling. Yeah. <laughs> Is it Starling or Sterling? Starling. Because you have it spelled both ways on your sheet. Do I? I will blame. You got a sheet? 
Yeah, I didn't give it to you. Oh, it's, my it's, God, you gave her a fucking cheat sheet. He did say I could give it to you, but she said you didn't like get it last time. You didn't yeah, want I it last time. it last time, and you're like, fuck it, let's fly blind. And I'm like, so okay. You offered me this last time? I did, yeah. See, it's, it's Sterling and then Starling. I'm going on the to next blame a uh, uh, fucking deadline from which I copy pasted this <laughs> for not having really good uh, research and fact checkers. That's amazing that you offered that to me and I said no. You did? I mean, do you want to look at this one? No, no. That's exactly what you said last time. <laughs> 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 so I figured, I was like, Trisha, you can slip it to her if she wants you. Didn't want it from me, man. You guys are here to do the work. I'm here to, you know, be inappropriate. We're off to a bang-up start. Like <laughs> a little sandwich. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they've already got a writer's room up and running. I think they don't have a cast yet for who's going to play Clarice Starling. Um, do you guys have an affinity for the character? Are you a Silence of the Lambs fan? It was the first movie that I watched when I was a t- kid, teenager, child, whatever, I, whenever it came out, mm-hmm. that gave me such nightmares. I couldn't sleep for... I, um, Just couldn't. Yeah, it scared the crap out of me. Yeah. yeah. When did it come out? 94? 94, 93. 91. 91. That seems... I was older then. I was just <laughs> thinking how inappropriate my father let me watch that when I was 11. <laughs> okay, Why it wasn't... putting the... the lotion in the basket? <laughs> <laughs> she puts the lotion on her body. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this, yeah. 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 No. It, it's not the right one. I, it's, I must have. There must have been something before that that was scary. I'm thinking of because '91, I was like 16 or something. 15. Um, I don't yeah, know. It, 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 unless you saw it in the theater, like it's completely realistic that you saw it like around that time. Or if you did see it in the theater, you were still at home at that point. Anyway, it scared the Jesus out of me, and I couldn't sleep for. Her. Uh, so then, will you be tuning in for Clarice? Eventually. I don't know. You know, I probably, I'll check it out. I have such a, I, I so badly wanted to get, um, uh, I can't even remember the name of it right now. Jesus Christ. A new show? No, the serial killer one that I wanted to, to um, do, get going. Um, oh. Huh? Um, Not Mind no, Hunters. No, 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 the one that you Hearts, with, yeah, Hearts, yeah, Hearts, yeah, Hearts, by Chelsea Kane. And I tried for like two years to get it going, and it was always not the right time. It was like, we don't want a female serial killer. We don't want this. We don't want that. And the following was on, and whatever. And now I've aged out of the role, and it's going to go to somebody else. Um, but uh, so I'm always like a little bit, just a little bit ego hurt and pissy when it comes to things like serial killer shows. But I always end up watching them because I love them. I'm drawn to, to that. Reading it though, not watching it. Really? I get too scared. I love to read it. I love to read it, but I get too Trisha scared. Trisha still hasn't watched Game of Thrones because she read the books. I'm waiting for the last two, damn it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, even though I don't know uh, what is in any of the books because I won't read them because I forgot how to read. Um, Me I, too, that's I, why I didn't want that. I uh, see. I have a feeling that whatever you get in the last two books, you like more than what people got in the last two seasons. I'm just saying, maybe. It's true. People were yeah. very disappointed. A little, uh, a little heartsick over it. Aww. Aww. Just stab her in the heart one more time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like it. I think that you know, CBS has got this this sort of thing going. They've got Evil right now, which is mm-hmm. doing really well, and people seem to love it. So, I mean, I haven't seen it because I canceled my cable, but um, I hear it's good. Um, so, I don't know. I, I like that sort of. Um, that thing that networks are doing where it's procedural but it's serialized as well. So you can sort of follow along. If you miss an episode, it's all right. You just sort of... Yeah. And I'm hoping that it's, it somehow finds a way to be different than most other procedurals because mm. Cruise Starling is such a great character and so much of that story is about... It's, it's less about Hannibal Lecter and it's more about her confronting her own demons and her own past and, and finding ways to, uh, to reclaim her own agency in a world that seems not built for her. Great character for someone to dive into, for oh, sure. Yeah. Though so so di- like multi-dimensional and flawed and yeah. messed up. And I just hope it's not like a regular old cop drama starring Clarice Starling, the plucky young graduate from FBI's Quantico. But for CBS, you're thinking that's probably the, the, the good chance it's going it, that it, way. It could be that way. I hope right. not, but it could be. Um, were you guys uh, okay? I gotta do quick math. Okay, good. Doctor Strange fans. Of the movie? Like of the original? No, of the movie that came out. 
With, I uh, liked Doctor Strange with Benedict. Cumberba I've yeah. never seen it. You've Here. never seen it? I'll be saying that a lot tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah. I really liked it. I think that he's so interesting to watch, and I thought that it was sort of this, like, a hero that was sort of, like, relatable. Um, if that makes any sense. It totally does. And I think he follows in the mold of a lot of Marvel heroes, which is like, here's the, the plucky, cocksure, egocentric dude who is humbled by something, who decides to take what he's learned and fight crime with it. Um, but I was, I was taken by just how the movie looked. Like, it looked unlike any other Marvel movie I'd seen before, because there's all this, like, dimensional folding and crazy alternate, like, parallel realms. It and was really textured. Yeah. Like it really, just viewing it, it just seemed like it wasn't as bright and shiny as most Marvel movies. Yeah, for sure. And I was really excited they're making a sequel because this is the world we live in. Um, it was going to Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. But uh, the director of the first one is no longer going to be directing the second one. Scott Derrickson has parted ways with Marvel due to quote-unquote creative differences. Mm. Um, which can mean a number of different things mm -hmm. in Hollywood. My gut is that it means that they wanted him to hit a release date that he didn't think he could make a good movie and hit. And uh, because Marvel is, you know, to both their credit and their detriment, they're a machine and yeah. they have a plan. And every movie needs to come out when it comes out because there's another movie coming out four months. It's got to be part of that. And it's, it's the fabric of the way they tell stories. And Kevin Feige is the creative sort of godhead who sits at the top of that particular pyramid, and so it's very much my way or the highway, and it seems as if this came to a head where Scott wanted either more time or the script wasn't where he was happy with or we want to make it look new and different and awesome in ways that we haven't cracked yet, and the Marvel said, well, we got to have a movie out, man. Right. You, you have here, because I have the notes. Because you have the notes. Um, that, it's May 7th, 2021. So that, they have to get cracking on They have to get cracking. I mean, it was supposed to start shooting this coming May. And wow. like, the amount of time that it takes to build one of those There's machines. There's no way. It's super fucking hard. It, it would be hard even if the same guy was doing it. Mm -hmm. But if you've got to start from scratch with a new director and a potential new writer, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not the most ideal way to make movies. I'll do it. Okay. We solved it, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <It's> Feige. <laughs> who's, who's Doctor Strange in the movie? Is it Benny plays him? Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, yes. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, but plays his... his um... Buddy Wong. Benedict Wong. Y yes. Yes. I met him in Portugal this year. He was super cool. He was very yeah, funny and sweet. He was just at a convention I was at, too. He was so nice. He's a good guy. Yeah. I, I had yeah, met him lovely. at the convention we did in London um, when we decided to do a Battlestar podcast. He was just, he was one of the guests and hanging out in the green room and he just sat next to me one day. He's like, hi, I'm Benny. How are you? He's like, oh shit, Wong, how are you, man? <laughs> He's like, what do you do? He's like, I do a dumb podcast. He's like, oh, I'm an actor. He's like, I know. I've seen you in the movies. It's like every third movie. <laughs> you're like really good at things. Oh. Yeah. Benny. Benny. It was not quite as much fun as meeting uh, John Rhys Davies. Mm. Who, uh, John is fantastic. I have gotten pretty drunk. With John. <laughs> <laughs> I, the first day I was at this convention, uh, we were in one booth. He, he was signing in the booth next to me, and like the most lovely man. And like clearly, he was early seventies, I yeah. think. Like his knees were not quite what it should be. His back wasn't great, but he was wearing a three-piece suit. So behind there, and every time somebody came up for his, his autograph, he would stand up and like reach over and shake their hand. And I was like, dude, like, I see the, the, the effort you're putting, I see the exertion on your face. He's like, well, they, they came for an autograph, so I'm giving them the thing. And he would always pass me by, and he, I don't think he ever knew my name, but he would pass me by, he would clap me on the shoulders. You handsome devil, how are you today? I was like, oh, Sala thinks I'm a handsome devil. <laughs> you young buck, you doing all right? Yes, I am doing all right, I love you so much. So great. I just, and I'm like, by the, by the end of it, I was like, listen, man, this is weird. I know I never do this, but can I take a picture with you? Because, like, fucking Sala. He's like, I, I know. <laughs> There's actually a lot of that that goes back on, you know, at, at the conventions. Yeah. When, <laughs> when the curtains are closed. Can I take a picture with you? Mm. <laughs> like, there's, I have two cool ones, actually. I'm going mm. I'm gonna plug it here on my website. I just posted them mm. because, um, um, I'm donating all, all the money to um, the wild wildlife. Um, we're doing the cameos as well, but yeah. um, Wires Wires is a is an Australian uh, is a New South Wales uh, animal rescue. Thank and 
Um, and I'm going to donate the... Se- uh, di- di- uh, anyway, I'll just continue. Um, from my shop site, I'm going to donate to HBS or HSUS Global, uh, who are also down there. But the reason I brought it up mm. was I was, going, I was trying to scrounge and find everything I could to add more items to my shop, right? And I, was, I found these three that just happened to be backstage at a convention, and two are of me and Clive, uh, Clive Stanton. And that guy, one of them is I am lifted literally like a, like a ballet or whatever. Like he's got, he goes, just come and jump, and it's I'm like going to lift dancing. you up. dancing. I'm like, I like that you yeah, go dirty ballet. Dancing. They're dirty, dirty dancing. dancing thing. You have the time of your like, life. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm six feet tall. And he lifted me. The first time I was like, I aborted it. I was like, no, I, I can't do it. He's like, just trust me. And the picture is the fur, full perfect. I'm ramrod straight. And he's got me lifted up in the air like this. Do you remember? And my face is going, ha! Ah! <laughs> I'm like, okay, let me down. Let me down. And he's literally got me just like... That dude can lift a girl up. Do you remember when we, we were in Germany yeah. at the Battlestar Galactica convention and you were doing that with Michael Trucco? No, that in was the Rika. Of the bar? Oh, you, no, it was Rika. It wasn't you. It was Rika. Sorry. I think I was telling the story. You were telling the story, then Rika said, <laughs> And Rika's like, it. I'm 100 pounds. Lift me up. And yeah, and Michael Trucco was, yeah, we have some pictures of that. On my phone, probably. We do. Of James Callis going, ah. <laughs> There was some alcohol involved there, though. Anyway, sorry, I, we totally... No, this, this is what happens this, when this I don't get the, the notes. This is the point. Like, I, listen, we could just read this fucking news, but who gives a shit? I want to hear about, like, hoisting Trish in the air. <laughs> uh, and at that same convention, I saw, it was the most adorable thing, is Benedict Cumberbatch angling to meet John Cleese. And he was so bashful and timid about it. He's like... There's a fucking python over there. It's like, I know. He's like, can I go? And he was like, like hopscotch. Like, can I, can I hop in this double dutch? I want to go meet. Like, no, 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 not going to go now. And then he finally did it. It was like, he just like, the, the, he like shrank like this. Like, Mr. Cleese, I'm such a big fan. He's like, everybody's a fan of somebody, mm-hmm. including Dr. Strange. And John Cleese is like, who are you? <laughs> no, he was cooler than that. I'm the dick. He was cooler than me. <laughs> um, were, uh, were either of you fans, I think I know at least very one answer to this question. I'm not sure about the other one. Fans of the television show Firefly. I've never seen it. I dated Nathan while he was filming the pilot. So. <laughs> uh, I, I, did, I, I, told, uh, <laughs> I told Katie that this week... I was not going to have any news about her ex-boyfriends. Um, it's true. Because last, last time... Last week, it was every question was like, was so like, how do you feel about the new Star Trek movie, Katie? And I was like, really? This? Hey, they're making a Lord of the Rings show. Motherfucker, awesome. again? Have you been to New Zealand? <laughs> Watch it twice. <laughs> so now we're going to ask Trish about her exes. <laughs> yeah. Um... There's always parental talk about a, a Firefly reboot, you know, because... It'd be so much fun. So much fun, and the, there's so much love for that show, even still, 12 years since its cancellation or whatever. Um, and part of the TCAs, as we talked about, um, Fox executives are like, yeah, we'd do it. Like, if there's a good idea for it, like, yeah, we're down. We're all about, like, exploiting IP that we already own and making a TV show that we know has a built-in audience. And, uh, and Tim Minear, who was uh, the showrunner, Said like, I would love to do it. I can. I'm making two shows, but uh, but Josh might have a, a thought or two. Or oh hey, um, and then then suddenly everybody starts tweeting stuff, and like Nathan's tweeting about it, and Alan Tudyk is tweeting about it. Yeah, and, Jewel was tweeting about. It. That's how I knew about it. Yeah, like it it, I I am. I don't often like when they just like let's go back to the well for the sake of going back to the well. I was not a fan of the X-Files reboot that they just did, because it just, it, it didn't have the, it, it, it both was the same show that I watched before, but now, like, The Emperor had no clothes, and I see how limiting that show was. It was very much a product of its time, and they never quite updated it to be a modern-day thing. Um, so sometimes I'd, like, leave well enough alone. It, in my memory, it exists better than I feel like it's going to be in a reboot. But I still really want a Firefly reboot. 
Or not a reboot, just a continuation. But would it have to be a limited series to get everybody back? I mean, Nathan is kind of busy on The Rookie, and Alan's on a new show, and, like, it's hard to get everybody back. Would you want it where it's... um, Oh, why, thank you. Um, Where it's, like focused on maybe Marina's character or somebody else or else it's as many people they can get back and then somebody else playing um, Captain Mal. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it doesn't work unless you have that cast back in some version. You can't have like a spark or like a, a group of them. You have to have everybody or nobody, right? Like a... I mean, Arrested Development did a, a somewhat effective job of like, listen, we can't get everybody at the same time. So let's construct this sort of sequel so that we can have this cluster together, and then they'll hand off to this cluster together, and then they'll hand off to this cluster. Um, but I think probably a limited series is the smartest way to do it. Like six episodes, just tell one big story, and get those that cast back. And, and it's, it's a fucking magical show, and I would just love to see more of it. I'm all about more. If there is a show, if you could reboot or continue any show, what would you do? <clears throat> Uh, I should maybe say not one that you're in. <laughs> <laughs> to remove the profit motive from yeah, the that <laughs> <laughs> I, I would absolutely 100% love to do uh, Longmire movies. Um, the series will never happen again, but wow. movies like the, but we, it was we also sort of fair so recent <clears throat> it wouldn't make sense to no them. exactly yeah but I think that that was the continuation of sort of like we thought they were gonna do it like Jesse Stone movies sort mm. of you know a Longmire movie every two years sort of something like that and uh, Warner Brothers just was not into it we sat down with them and he he just was like you know that's a great idea never heard back <laughs> so. I, uh, I've, I've heard that a couple times, that Warner Brothers can be somewhat um, unwilling to make money. Yeah, well, because they, they, own, they own it, but I think Netflix has the rights to it for a certain amount of time, and I think if they were to do a movie, they would have to share it, and they don't want to share it, so they'd rather just not do it. Uh, on, the, on the internet, not too long ago, I, uh, I posited the idea that Warner Brothers should do a, 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 a Constantine Lucifer crossover. Like, you know, just like, even a fucking like two hour movie, miniseries, 10 episodes, whatever. And uh, I, had on, I got on good authority that, like, yeah, Warner Brothers isn't interested in that. Like, Tom Ellis wants to do it. Like, Matt Ryan seems like he wants to do it. There's a bunch of writers who wants to write it, but they're like, eh, we don't want to make that money. Yeah, they're an interesting. I've never quite understood those big sort of movie. Yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's just sitting there for you guys. Just they have so much that's just sitting there, though. Mm. So a, the li- a library of stuff, or stuff that's <clears throat> stuff that done. they own the IP to, right. that they'll just like sit on it forever and and not do anything, but they won't let it go because God forbid someone else do it. So <clears throat> I've said this before a few times, and it's not like I even watched the show because again, I didn't have a TV. But um, for some reason, I've got in my head that Katie and I should do Cagney and Lazy. Yeah. It'd be really right? fun. Yeah. I think we should too. We've been talking about it forever. You should totally fucking do it. It'd be so much fun. Uh, I want to see, and I and I actually researched. Speaking of Warner Brothers, because <laughs> I think that it was actually them who had the rights to it. I wanted. I seriously, my favorite show growing up as a kid was Night Court, and I uh, right, and I so badly wanted to do like a female version of Night Court. Um, I just, I loved the idea of, you know, this judge who's, you know, dressed as a clown underneath. Sort You'd of have like, to learn magic though. Yeah. Who, who would you cast as your Marky Post? The like himbo lawyer love interest. I don't know. There's so many. <laughs> so many beautiful boys. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I know. It's just like, ooh. You like put kid in a candy store and my eyes went so big. I was like, all of them? <laughs> yeah. You know, like Madeline Kahn and Blazing Saddles. Like, yes. No, 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 no. Yes. It's like me swiping right. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had another question in there, but I forgot it. Oh, fucking digression, because I can do it too. Have you guys been listening to uh, to Dolly Parton's America? 
No. Big fan of Dolly, though. It is, uh, it's a podcast series that Radiolab is doing. It's a nine-part thing, just sort of investigating the Dolly Parton of it all. And the fact that, that A, she's thoroughly unrecognized and unheralded as a songwriter. Yes. And the work that she did, especially when she was younger, <laughs> between like 21 to like 30, is on the same parallel as like Lennon and McCartney and Bob Dylan and just this vast library of, as she calls them, sad ass girl songs. <laughs> and like, they're sad fucking songs. Like they, they, and they dive into it. And what Dolly means in America, what she meant 30 years ago, what she means today, the, the willingness she has to puncture her own image and she knows exactly what she looks like and she knows exactly where the jokes are coming. It's very, it's very eight mile that way. Um, but it's, and also the ability of Dolly, present day Dolly, to unify people in a way mm. that few entertainers can do. Like you go to a Dolly concert and it is the United Colors of Benetton. Like everybody's there because she's singing songs about poverty and lack of opportunity and, and sort of celebrating you know, your own moxie and everybody can kind of wire into that. Um, I have nothing else to say besides you should listen to this fucking podcast because it's got a lot of Dolly in it, which is mm. nice a lot of perspective on Dolly, especially from the, the host is a guy named Jed Abumrad, who's Lebanese, like his parents were born in Lebanon, and his dad was a huge Dolly Parton fan in Lebanon. Oh, interesting. And because, and they, they interview this, like, this Nigerian <laughs> woman who sings Dolly Parton cover songs, because they all grew up poor. They all had these little shacks in the middle of the mountains somewhere, yeah. and she's singing about living with like the moss on the trees and my shotgun shack and the, there's and my a, coat of many colors and my coat of many colors and my Texas Tennessee mountain home and like everybody can kind of understand what that means mm. no matter where you're from um, so you should listen even if you're not a Dolly fan but Dolly is a national treasure Dolly is amazing she's kind of great I saw her in concert like two years Did ago you? oh I'm so jealous she's amazing she's amazing this woman I thought I was like there are moments in life when I become very tough very, I'm not, I'm not like overtly like I'll punch you in the face. Like that's not who I am, unless you fuck with my family. Yeah. Um, and then, but we were there with my mom, and my mom doesn't get out much. She doesn't like crowds, and she was so excited to see Dolly at the Hollywood Bowl. And you can eat food at the Hollywood Bowl, so my mom had chips, and she was so excited. And she had her wine because she adds ice to wine. So she had her wine, and she was drinking her wine and eating chips, sitting down we, we in like a box seat, mm. watching Dolly. And she was so happy and so excited and so just like, it was like the best moment of my life to see my mom that engaged and that excited. And this woman reached, literally reached over and grabbed my mom's chips and went, can you not? Oh, oh damn. <laughs> and I just leaned over and went, bitch, you cannot. <laughs> In the middle. And she wasn't even being loud. Like, I mean, she was right next to me and it wasn't annoying me. So like, calm down. Like, this is, everyone's eating. Half the people are drunk. Like, calm, I was so upset. Dolly was amazing. Dolly was amazing. <laughs> and you're like, somebody hold my fucking ear. Somebody hold my ear. <laughs> I am gonna, I'm gonna rip that fur coat off that woman. It's not that cold. Uh. <laughs> Fucking California. <laughs> Where's PETA? <laughs> That's awesome. I have no Dolly stories beyond watching 9 to 5 and feeling things. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my. What's this picture about, Dad? Feminism? I'm on board. This is great. <laughs> Perverts. <laughs> um, I shall love strong women for the rest of my life. This is great. <laughs> you tell him. Poison that guy's called me. Which happens, and like birds help them do it. It's great. <laughs> um, did you guys see the Knives Out movie? Yes. So did you not see the Knives Out? No, that's Daniel Craig, right? I just saw yes. something the other day about him. Like it was a blurb that hit the. Uh, one of the scenes that I was like, what is this? I'd never even heard about it. So it, uh, good. It's, you, you can tell. Oh, no, go for it. No, I'm no, just no, talking I, enough. I, I've, I've already like, sworn. I think he's so it. handsome. Uh, the Daniel Craig? Mm -hmm. mm. He is doing the best Foglorn Leghorn I've ever heard a Brit do. Like, he is having the most crazy-ass fun 
like it's a donut with a donut hole in the donut hole. <laughs> I said, what? And he's like, he gained a little bit of like James Bond weight, so he's like stretching his little tweed suit a bit. And just like it's, he's, he's totally foghorn like horn. But it's, it's, a, it's a fucking murder mystery. It's a murder mystery the way they used to make murder mysteries. I heard it was up for co- musical? Uh, they sing the it? Golden Globes, no, it's musical comedy. And the Golden oh, Globes okay. is the same category because international people are dumb. Um, like, what kind of category is that, musical or comedy? What? <laughs> Oh, those two are the same at all. The one musical of the year gets really lucky. <laughs> totally. well. I mean, Cats was like, come on, guys. <laughs> we, we got Could this you one. imagine? And you said, well, you said you're going to see it tomorrow. I'm going to totally go see Cats tomorrow. You have to. And you have to go see it because they pulled all the screeners. Yeah, I know. It's like, no, we can't. No, 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 no. You got to pay for you that. You got to pay. They need the money. <laughs> It's uh, actually double. If anybody wants movie. to go, I'm probably going to swing in around like 1 o'clock, maybe an arc light. I'm not sure which one, but I have to see this fucking movie. It's in the bathroom. It's like the tiniest. They're like, here's your iPad. We'll totally. be back Just in two hours. Go sit in the parking lot. Nobody wants it, so you can have it. Um, so yeah, Cats, I'm sure, was jockeying for best musical. And they're like, son of a bitch. It's we, we didn't even get best song. I know. Fucking hell. That, you know what, though? You look at that cast, and it is just a tragedy. It's just, you just, it's like amazing actor after amazing actor after so talented. After, God, I love that person. What were you thinking? I mean, it's more like alimony, palimony, child support. College. Trying to be taken seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like trying to be an actor, pop star, sure. Maybe get a Grammy. I don't know. Loves cats. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> Why didn't they call me then? Yes, I know Trisha funny. was like, I'll do it. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember when Sean, 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 Sean Young dressed up like Cat? David Letterman, right? That would have been you. Could you imagine if you committed that hard in the movie? It was that bad. You got in it. You found out where the casting call was. It's like, here I am, everybody. (laughs) Rum, dum, dum, dagger. Jellico, Pelico, what like, do we say? I did Tossing play a your cat, tail, actually. <laughs> I, already, I already got my fix playing a cat. Did it? I, you probably never saw it because it was super hard to see. I haven't even seen it. Um, on Sony's uh, Powers, it was a graphic novel Powers. Mm-hmm. So Sony PlayStation did it with... They had a network uh, once. Yes, they did. The Sony PlayStation um, Network. And Yeah, and it was on it. Was on it um, called Powers, and I, I played Agent Lang, FBI Agent Lang, mm. whose secret power is turning into a cat. Didn't we both play Black Cat, though? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, uh, we um, both did. But I got to play a live version. I got, I got to turn into a cat. I mean, no need to brag. I mean, I, they, didn't do, <laughs> they didn't do, like, the... Um, yeah, we both played pa- Black Cat on we Spider-Man mm-hmm. video games. Um, but uh, I turned into a cat when I got aroused. <laughs> Ironically, you do bite people. I do. She does. Oh, if I have a few drinks. <sighs> You've had a few drinks. I'm not sure if I'm a vampire or a cat. And you know what? Now I'm playing Dracula. This perfect Make casting. Complete sense. Perfect I'm, casting. I'm, I'm frightened now. In ways it's a that sign I'm of love. It's yeah. A, yeah, it's it's a form of love. People that I love get bit. Yep. And if you haven't been bit, you just are left out. You feel a little sad until it happens, and then you're like, oh my god, that hurts so bad. <laughs> Then, uh, then I guess I'm glad to not be loved by Trisha, I suppose. I don't get you invited are to any of the They're little love net. Tomorrow night yeah. when we're doing the Bowser Galacticast, guess Woo-hoo. what's going to happen? <laughs> Working not too far. What a way to make a living. Oh, best little whorehouse in Encino. Aww. Aww. What? What? I love that movie. <laughs> Uh, what the fuck are we talking about? Oh, Knives Out. There we go. I, I, I feel like usually my job is to keep Kevin on track when he's like so stoned he forgets what he's talking about. And uh, I, I was like, what are we, where, where, how did we get here? Oh, right. Accents. Not. Um, but yeah, so Knives Out. You should totally watch Knives Out. It's crazy fun. I loved it. Um, it's so, it's, it's just well wrought. It's like a Swiss watch, right? Like every little line counts, every scene matters. It all escalates and adds up to something. It finds a way to also Trojan horse, a little bit of commentary in there. 
about uh, Anna de Armas, who plays the lead, is fantastic. But she's amazing. But nobody seems to know what country she's from. <laughs> it's it was pretty like, funny. It's our Peruvian maid, our Ecuadorian maid, or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of great. Um, but Ryan Johnson has decided he maybe wants to make a sequel to Knives <gasps> Out. That would be amazing. Right? I'm hoping that he's making like a cutlery themed series of murder mystery things. <laughs> Spoons forward. <laughs> a spoonful of arsenic. Right. Uh, forked tongue. That could be handy. Just forked. That's Just the forked. name of it. Fork. Fork you. Uh -huh. I, I had a ladle pun that I can't remember. <laughs> because... Later puns yeah, great one about barbecue tongs. Yeah, I lost absolutely. it. It was right there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> spatula mon amour. Because it's Italian. <laughs> and it takes place in Rome. You can do this all day, Ryan. You can fucking call us. Behind the Bar Productions. Yeah! <laughs> we did it. Pay us our money, Ryan, and we'll give you a title. <laughs> What's it about? You do the hard work. You do the work. Come on, man. We've given you the inspiration, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that's it there. They're making a Knives Out sequel. And that's I just great. wanted to make puns. I loved it. I loved the movie. Best. I thought yeah. it was so intelligent, and it reminded me of like playing Clue when I was a kid. I was all about it. Clue. I hate it. I never read the instructions. So I was like, how do you play this game? We had it. It's like, am I actually killing somebody in this game? Is that what this is? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I'm just getting do we just roll the dice and... Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, would, I, I don't have that in mind. So every time I would play, I would just be like, fuck it. I don't know. The pipe in the observatory with the colonel with the mustard. And I would never get it right. And I would just like, well, I don't like this game now. It sucks. <laughs> I never made I wanna, it that far. I want to play sorry. Right? So I know who wins sorry. Connect four. It's much easier. Boom. Although I, I play a mean game of Catan. Really? <sighs> I don't know these games. Oh my God, you will get so addicted and what so angry. What did you angry. do on the farm if you didn't play like Connect Four? We so played Uno. Okay. And we played. Um, you can come to the barbecue. And we played. Uh, what the, what's that one I brought down to Cabo? The one where you yell. It's a commodities game. Oh yeah, but it's it's very it's very similar to Catan in a sense, but it's more like Jackass. It's more like where you scream at shit. Yeah, you have commodities. It's about the stock market, and yes. ours on the farm was an old one. It was my grandmother's. It was about wheat and barley and oats, and you have to get the same. You have to get nine of each one, and then you could corner the market. Oh shit! It's, yeah. There's a lot of yelling. There's a lot. It's like two, 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 three, three, three. You change, you exchange cards, and then there's a bear and a bull. The bear's bad. You're like the bull's raising, good unless you're raising with tiny it. capitalists. Yeah, <laughs> it's like. You're and now the new one is gold and silver and oil and anyway. I, can I can I say? Yeah. Uh, I'll admit something in public. I do not understand. I understand nothing about the stock market. I watch Trading Places every Christmas because it's one of my favorite Christmas movies. <laughs> I still have no idea what happens at the end of that movie because I don't like, okay, so we got the frozen concentrated orange juice futures and we know and so we're buying low and selling high but then we're calling and people like, I just don't know, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> and every year, like Fortune Magazine will like put out some explainer for morons like me of, here's what's happening, you dumb cough, this is how the stock market works. And I'm like, not helping, not gonna give a shit because I don't care. And then the next year comes and I'm like, I just like orange juice, this is cool. <laughs> Eddie Murphy's gonna win, right? Yes, thank you very much. Were you like going to, uh, were you gonna explain to me how it works? All right, can we get this man a microphone and he can explain to me exactly how the fuck, you know, Billy Ray Valentine gets a yacht by the end of that movie? Okay, so. Hi guys. Hey, what's your name? My name is Aviv. Aviv? Yes. Thank you so much for illuminating me on my uh, decades-old quest to understand trading places. Um, did you know that Mr. Rogers' car was stolen? And when did the you steal it? The, well, then when the thieves discovered it was Fred Rogers' car, they returned it. Oh, that's wow. so sweet. Okay, so in trading places, they... Whoa. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> So in trading places, they're selling futures and say they can set sell prices and buy prices. So they're driving, 
they're driving up the price really, really high at first, and then they're setting their sell prices, so they're telling everybody that they promise to sell at, let's say, $10, right? And then when the real orange juice report comes out and the, they were all lying or whatever, and the price drops, then they're doing their buy prices. So they're buying the stock low and selling it high at the same time, which is how they get all that money. They're you don't care. It's fine. Manipulating the market. Did you follow that? I did. Because you're way smarter than I am. Because <laughs> I still... Trust me, I'm not. I mean, like, that was like explaining to a four-year-old, and I'm still fucking lost. But I appreciate... They got in trouble for it, though, right? Uh, they did not get in trouble no? for it. And it wasn't illegal at the time. that's incredibly illegal. <laughs> getting, getting insider information from government sources was not illegal at the time and wasn't illegal until, like, the Obama administration. Too bad for Martha Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she just came a couple years too late. Now, she's so relatable now, though, dog. Yeah. <laughs> But they, they made a she law making it prison. They made a law making it illegal in like 2011, and they call it the Eddie Murphy rule. Do you think oh, it's because like President Obama watched Trading Places one Christmas and was like, "That feels illegal. <laughs> we shouldn't do that." Uh, somebody get me somebody on the phone from uh, regulation. We gotta put a <laughs> stop to this right now. This feels wrong. Yet, if you're rich, you can still invest in, in racehorses to yes. hide your tax money as I mean, a shelter. So you can still do that. Rules don't apply if you're rich. No, of course not. Uh, uh, okay, we have one last news story, and then we're going to get to the Q&A, um, which should be fun, because we have shit to give away. And that was a rhyme. <laughs> Sweet. I know. No more rhyming. I mean it. Yes. Thank you, nerds. Um, Christian Bale is going to be in a fucking Marvel movie. Woo! Oh, damn it. I'm sorry, Katie. Oh, uh, it's Thor. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. He died. Okay. I thought, I thought I made it the whole way through. I was like, son of a bitch. It's all right. We can laugh about it. Okay. <laughs> That was the thing. He's uh, going to be in Thor, but he's going to be in the one with Natalie, right? He's going to be in the one guessing. with Natalie, yes. Christian Bale is going to be in Thor 4, Love and Thunder. Um, yeah. His, uh, his role is still being put under wraps, but I find it so delightful that like Christian Bale's like, you know what? Fuck it. I was Batman once. Why can't I be like a third banana in the fourth Thor movie? Why not? <laughs> Kate Blanchett did it. She looked real Hell good in that yes. movie. Kate Blanchett, like, she did not leave a bit of scenery unchewed. No. And I was impressed by it. I love watching her work. It just makes me excited. Because <laughs> she's... I, uh, I've never seen anybody look like they're having more fun. And she's so pretty. She, she looked like a little butterfly at the Golden Globes <laughs> in a sea of oh. real shitty dresses. Ooh. Her dress was really shitty, too, Oh, though. I loved it. It was the color of a baby blanket. But th that... Yeah, it was like a cape. It looked like she was about to take off. Because she's a like, fairy. She's a fairy. <laughs> she's so perfect. She's, uh. <laughs> yeah, the dresses were really bad. They were bad. There was a couple good ones. Woo! Mm. 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 If I ever get there, I will be, I will get I'm much better than that. <laughs> if I'm ever at the Golden Globes, I'm going to wear a slamming dress. Just a big kidding. bow. <laughs> and J-Lo's. Because it'll be like the one time I'm there and I'm like, fuck it, notice me. <laughs> <laughs> I do not care if I lose, for I have already won. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Pratt Falls, you guys. <laughs> We're here all night. Uh... Okay, so we're going to move on to the Q&A, and, &A, and uh, if you guys are in the mood to sign some stuff, the yeah. fine people have left uh, merchandise like and goody things. You know what I have in my purse? Oh, you brought a thing? Uh, when I went, what, I just realized I had it when I saw the little Funko Pops. I have a little Starbucks Lego. Aww. I found it in my office when I was going through my shop, when I was it, trying to bar. find things for my shop. Yeah, so we can add that to the Who Wants a Little Thing. 
I had a bunch of sixes, and I'm like, well, that's not me. I'm not gonna, I gotta give that to Katie. Don't break it. Okay, so um, we are giving away, um, thanks to our good friends, uh, Brett Deacon at the 40X. We got a bunch of fucking 40X tickets to give away. Have you guys ever been to a 40X theater? No. We talked about this last time. We talked about it last time, but Trisha wasn't here, so we're doing it for the cheap seats. Yes. Um, it is like if you were a person who hates going outside but wants to like pretend that you like going outside, go see a 40X movie because like you're sitting in the seat. Oh, that's when they like spit on you and stuff. Yes, but it's it is totally not a dude just standing over you spitting no, on you. <laughs> Mister, is it really like that? Like the seat yeah. rocks, like the seat moves and, and shit. The seat moves like in the in the I saw uh, Rogue One. In a, in a well, that would be a good one to see. And like it, like when the crawl starts, it slowly moves back. And when there's wind over it, the, like wind is blowing in the. Oh, theater. that's why we said if you'd seen like a dog's journey, you would have been like, "Well, this sucks." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh god. And not even like the fun sucks, like no, a, like, like a swallow like, going to town ugh. on a pug. No. Um, <laughs> oh man, tonight, you guys, <laughs> the dream is alive. <laughs> um, so yes, we have, we got five sets of tickets today. Wow. And we got one more thing. I picked this up at the Long Beach Comic Con. I saw it and Ooh. I said, this would be a great giveaway. It is the season three press kit for Battlestar Galactica. Wow. Um, <laughs> the good folks at Golden Apple Comics were like, you should use this as a giveaway. And I said, I will. Um, but it's gorgeous. Oh yeah, that one. I remember that one. Yeah, this was the like the, we got a fucking Peabody. We're going to spend some money, bitches. And so they spent all this money. It was the year the Peabody's went downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Us in South Park, people were like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> <laughs> right? James. Those are all really pretty pictures. Gorgeous. <laughs> Never nominated for a Golden Globe. Motherfuckers. Um, so yes, I figure like the best question of the night will get this thing uh, signed by our uh, my co-hosts. Wow. So aren't Golden come, Globes come movies? The they're both, aren't they? No. Um, yeah. There's two oh, they are. Oh. <laughs> I did watch it. Yeah. So uh, so yeah. While they ask their questions and we ponder our answers, you guys can sign, sign what you need to sign. And uh, so yeah, let's do some questions. Who do we got first? JC. Uh, yeah. Yes, he is. Hello. Check, check. Like. Um, silence and cheering. Okay, so that's this sign, guy. And then we each sign her. All right, that was a suspenseful moment, but we've got uh, David Lovera. David. Oh, hey, for bro. Hey, David. How's it going? Good. Um, the, the rules are you have to ask a question that all three of us can answer. Oh, I thought it was them too. Oh, well. I'm sorry. Listen, I can always jump in and be like, listen, it was so hard, episode 312. Well, actually, no, I do have, I, I wrote two. So one, I guess, you, it would be for the three of you guys. Uh, what show have you auditioned for and did not get the part? Um, and when it aired, you were happy that you did not get it. I can't answer this question. <laughs> uh, what show did you audition for and didn't get the part, but when it aired, you were glad you didn't? <laughs> Didn't audition for it though. Um. Uh, I, I'll start. It was, a, it was a show that I went up to staff on. It was going to be my very first TV show. Um, this must have been 2010, and there was a show on NBC. I'm not sure if you guys remember this, but it was about a dude who wore a cape, and it was called The Cape. <laughs> and The Cape was the part of the dude's costume that had like superpowers and shit. So he would just kind of stand there and his cape would do shit, like the boringest version of Doctor Strange, you know, because like he couldn't do other magic and just his cape. It uh, lasted all of like 11 episodes before I got canceled. Um, but I wanted that job so fucking bad. Like I, I went and I, I, I prepped for it, I read the pilot script, I knew it was garbage, but whatever. And I went in there and, uh, and didn't get the job. And then I saw the show. And I had friends who were like, they really could have used you on the cape. And I said, no. <laughs> There's nothing that I could have done to fix the cape. Um, so that, that is my story of the bullet dodged. Um, I'll go since you're signing. Um, mine's not necessarily like a bullet dodged. It's more like, oh, you didn't get that, but then you got this right after. Mm. 
Um, I really wanted the role in um, Once Upon a Time as Emma Swan. And I went in like six times for it. I auditioned so many times. I wanted it so bad. Didn't get it and then got Longmire like a week later. Hmm. You know, I, I was drawing a blank, but I auditioned a couple times for the evil one. Yeah, for Lana Perea's role. Yeah. yeah. And didn't get it and then... Yeah, I got something else afterwards. So sometimes it's been meant to be. Do you remember Ron Moore's pilot that y'all did? 17th Precinct. That one. I wanted that so bad, and I auditioned and went in for it, and they didn't hire me. And, I, and then he hired like so many people from Battlestar, and I was like, yeah. I, you know what? I bet, sorry. No, I, just, I think I saw that pilot. It was, it was a, a pilot that was a, it was a police procedural. So cool where magic was the norm instead of science. And it was really, um, it was a really interesting script. It was super cool. Yeah. Like witches and, and like, I think like my character played a witch, or, well, not my character. Was Stalker Channing? The character I went in on. Was, was that the one that I did? Yeah, you and Jamie. Yeah, Jamie was a lead. And James. Did you, did you get the role I went in on? You did. I did. Ooh. I'm sorry, then maybe <laughs> No, it was, it was one they didn't the actually want to see me for a long time. And then they, they finally saw me and I got the role like right away. And I, I, but, you know, it was, it was one of those lucky um, situations where um, Eamon Walker was already cast mm -hmm. as the He's lead. Great. He's amazing. I love him so much. Mm -hmm. And I had worked with him. He had done a, a lawyer show and I guessed it on this, a lawyer show. It was CBS. I can't remember what it was called. And he was so nice to me. The rest of the cast were not. Um, it was just one of those where they didn't really talk to each other and they, whatever. And he was so nice to me. Um, he actually did some, and he was a Battlestar fan. Mm. So he actually, so when I went in to read for, I was really nervous because Ron was in the room and like, it's actually hard to audition for somebody you know really well from yeah. something else because it's, it's just weird. And, but because Eamon was there and I was reading with him instead of reading with the casting director, it just felt comfortable. And I'd worked with him, and, and he's such a lovely man. Eamon Walker, Chicago Fire, the, the captain. I know him as Adebisi from Oz. Oh, yes. And it's, Oz was, Oz was such a good show, so fucking brutal. Yeah. A, and I remember seeing J.K. Simmons like at a restaurant and like skirting the long way to the restroom, because I'm like, that dude just rapes people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's like his thing. Vern Schillinger is a crazy Nazi rapist dude. Um, CSI with Mariska Hargitay, Christopher, Chris, sorry. <laughs> um, Chris um, Maloney. Maloney. I saw in Oz and I literally was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't in a Dick Wolf show anymore. <laughs> uh, well, dude, does that answer your question? Did we, did we hit the sweet spots? Yeah. Then you win some tickets. Thank you. Where are we going now, JC? All right, we got uh, Rob Sanchez. Ooh, hey, Mr. Sanchez, how are you? Um, to the girls and also for you, why do you, looking back to BSG, why do you think that series has held up so well? And it's a fan as well. Well, seeing we're doing a podcast of it now and we're doing a rewatch of it. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're intimately prepared to solve this particular question. We're doing one tomorrow night. Um, uh, I think it's that it's, it is about things that are true. And like real truth is sort of temporally fluid, right? Like it's a show that's about disaster. It's about genocide. It's about torture. It's about salvation. It's about faith. And it's about all of these things that do not feel like they need to be pegged in a particular time in a particular place. And it talks about them in such a way that it, it allows those themes to be somewhat eternal. So when you go back and watch a show like Battlestar, and I feel the same way, and I mentioned it when we had Ron Moore on the show, the West Wing also feels that way in that they're talking about gun control, they're talking about drug violence, they're talking about hurricanes, and natural disasters, and they're talking about all of these things that are still things we talk about as a society, as people between us, interpersonally, and Battlestar does a lot of that stuff, and it's about at its core, it's about the relationships between these people. And we feel those people, and we feel their wants and their needs, and we feel their, their, their victories and their defeats. 
And so that's, that's when a show gets to be somewhat immortal, is when the characters are strong enough and the themes are relevant enough at any time you'd watch it. Maybe. I can't add to that. No, and, and, and watching it now, it's actually almost more poignant now, or as poignant. Like it's 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 really it's been stunning for me to do a rewatch of it, and just be kind of taken in because there's enough time that has passed that I can actually watch it kind of as a viewer a little bit. I mean, you're still reminded of things on the day of being there or something, but um, it's just it's stunning to watch some of the like. I, some of your stuff, and like it, it's, it's just, it hits a core, but yet at the same time, it's set in space where you can still kind of remove yourself from your day to day and enjoy it as entertainment, but yet it's hitting you in a place where you're really um, affected by it. Right, I have to answer this so you don't get your prize. <laughs> <laughs> Or you could um, say, like, what she said. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. You know, I mean, I, I think because we were a science fiction show, we were very much dismissed as not real. So we could do whatever we wanted. And Ron Moore and the writers um, used that opportunity to, to comment on everything that was going on in the world at the time. So we were very much the only show that was doing it at the time, because everybody else was not allowed to touch it. Um, and so I think that it is a very authentic look at, at that time in, our, our, in history, but also the entire point of Battlestar is that, you know, well, not the entire point, but, you know, they say it so much, is that this, th this, this too shall happen again. Like, it's, it's, history continues to repeat itself because human beings don't change. We continue to make the exact same mistakes over and over and over again. This all happened the before show. and it will happen again. Right. That thing. I never had to say it. But, <laughs> <laughs> the, you know what I mean? Humans don't evolve. We don't change. We get smarter and technology gets better, but at our core, we're still as flawed as we've always been, so we'll always continue to make the same mistakes, and that's the, the sad truth of it. Yeah. The, one of the things that, that Trish and I are always kind of uh, struck by is how especially watching it now, what it must be like to have like capable leadership made of people who are like smart and careful and moral and who think deeply about issues and causes and effects. And there's a lot of times we're like, man, you know, I fucking wish that like Laura Rosa would run for actual president because I would much prefer the Rosa presidency uh, for all of its problems. Really, why? <laughs> 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 Although she did, at the end of last year, she did almost just, she did try and steal the election. She totally did. But I get why she did what she did. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, just, it's, it's, it, it is always, it continually reinforces its own level of, of quality by simply continuing to exist at a time where we are as flawed as we've always been. And there's always a, uh, like, I, I, I pray that we find ourselves in the hands of leaders who think as deeply about issues as the ones on that show did. Thank you. Thank you, come get tickets. Thank you. All right, Jonathan Charles. Mr. Charles. Hey man. Mark, ladies. How are you? Good, how you doing? Fantastic. Good. So my question is in regards to Joker, but not so much what you feel about the movie itself. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a movie that made over a billion dollars, biggest R-rated grossing movie of all time, um, has now got 11 Oscar nominations. What do you think, um, or what do you hope that Hollywood will take away from this movie? And as we all know, Hollywood tends to take the wrong message away from successful movies. So what do you hope they'll take away from it? And what do you think they will actually take away from it? Holy shit. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they will take the same thing they always take from this sort of thing, which is, hey, we should, uh, we should plumb our IP and just do more of this. 
because I do think that the Joker doesn't make a billion dollars if it's called Arthur, and there's no references at all to the DC universe. If it's just like a disaffected dude who like kind of goes mad and does awful things, if it's not a Batman movie, it doesn't make a billion dollars. So I think that it gives them cover to do interesting things because they kind of know that they can get it back. Um, and so I wish they would just take more chances on things. Like maybe that Arthur movie would have been more interesting mm -hmm. if it didn't have to find ways to, to, to bend over and make itself a Batman movie at the same time. Um, the thing I wish they would take from it is... Uh, <laughs> Come on, Mark. Um, I wish they would take a closer look at the ways they portray mental illness on screen. Um, I think that, that for some of the ways that the movie is smart about it, it's also very lazy about it. It's, he's got a very specific ailment and then a general I'm crazy ailment. And, and I think that specificity is what makes movies work. It's what makes us respond to them. And the more research you do and the, and the, the more accurate a picture you can portray of that, actually the better drama you get to, to, to squeeze out of it. And so just the, the like, what's his thing? Well, he laughs a lot and he's also kind of crazy and also kind of a sociopath and also kind of a, it felt a lot like the, the sampler platter of mental illness and a little bit more responsibility in that angle would be nice. Yeah, I don't know, I, I saw it, um, I know you had, I wasn't here, I didn't see it, but I know you, you talked about it in one of these, um, and you had specific thoughts on it. Um, I, I watched it and I was disturbed for a couple of days after I was in like this weird, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and maybe that's, maybe you just articulated sort of what it was, was, um, you know, I've, I have a sister with some mental illness and, and um, I was watching it, not to that extreme, um, in terms of violence and stuff, but it was so gratuitous in many ways, but it was also like, I couldn't quite put my finger on what, what was upsetting me for days, but I was in a fog for a couple of days. And to me at the time, I was like, well, that just means it was a really good movie. If, it, if it's got me sitting there thinking for a couple of days. But it was so disturbing, and I was watching it with um, any Lucifer fans here. I was watching with DB Woodside, a friend of mine, and we were both just like we sat there. <laughs> we were going to go to dinner afterwards, and then he had to go pick up his sister up at the airport, and he, we kind of looked at each other at the end of the movie and went, "Yeah, I don't think dinner would have been a good idea." <laughs> like, yeah. And I texted him the next day. I'm like, "Are you still like in a funk?" And he said yes, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but maybe that's it. But there was one, this isn't answering your question at all, but there was one point in it talking about coming back to the beginning of, of when I was saying sometimes you need to give an audience a little bit of breathing room. Um, I had a moment in that movie that I got, I got the nervous giggles because it was so intense for so long that it was when his mom had just had the stroke and he was sitting out there and the, the detective comes up to him and he's starting to feel stressed because obviously he had done the, he had killed the people. And he goes to walk in the exit of the glass door and he hits himself really hard on the, I couldn't stop laughing. I was crying laughing and it was not a funny moment. It was just, it was, I mean, it was a little funny. But I was going to say, <laughs> you also laughed when you dropped a motorcycle on me. So, like, you, you, True. It is, it, <laughs> and when Sharon fell off a cliff. Yeah, but this so is, it's your go-to when you're uncomfortable. It never has been in my life until recently, I guess, something happening with the age I'm in where I'm starting to get nervous giggles when it's something that really affects me. And... I got the nervous giggles in this, and because I was giggling, DB was looking at me like, I don't know why the fuck, I don't know why the fuck you're giggling, but I'm gonna giggle because you giggling is weird, and I'm gonna giggle too. And we were just like sitting there trying not to laugh, but it wasn't funny, it was like this disturbing, and I almost wanted to cry at the same time. So, as I'm not answering your question, but I just think that they'll probably take from it that let's just show more, like, the violent side of it instead of the, um, what's actually causing some of the, the, the problem. Um, I think you guys both said everything pretty eloquently. I mean, 
you know, I think what Hollywood is going to take from this is that, you know, um, R-rated movies that have a vehicle behind them are, you know, let's just make more R-rated movies. Um, so I think they'll do that and continue to, like you said, uh, branch off with the IPs that they have instead of give new voices an opportunity to create content. You know, I think that we have an overabundance of $100 million movies and, and you know, we've got a really great five million dollar indie sort of you know existence right now but we've really lost the 20 million dollar movie which i think that there's an opportunity for those and i wish that those would come back um but um i so i don't know i don't know what i wish that they you know you touched on the the violence and, and you touched on some stuff so i, I don't really know what I wish that they, I don't know, it's such an interesting question. Well, they said they're gonna make a sequel to it, right? Yeah. I mean, I was like, the, he's like glorified now for. Yeah, I mean, killing. Todd Phillips claimed that he doesn't quite have an idea for it, but maybe, and Joaquin, I think, is attracted by the idea of making a sequel, but mm. also repulsed a little bit by having the process of having to make a movie like that. Right. And the physical transformation, the emotional, just living in that zone for a while. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, I had, to, to your point, I had introduced a screening at the Alamo Draft House of Pitch Black um, oh, yeah. Yeah, a couple weeks ago. Um, and, and the thing that struck me was that was a $22 million movie that's not based on anything, that there's no movie stars, that it's just David Toohey had an idea and went to a movie, movie studio and they gave him $22 million yeah. to make that movie. Mm -hmm. And it's great and it's lean and it's smart and it's very effective and it's wonderfully diverse and and because you couldn't have done that movie for six but you yeah. didn't need a hundred you didn't need a hundred like i just needed this much yeah and that was a world in which you could get 22 million dollars to make a grown-up kind of mature science fiction thriller right. without needing a comic book or a book or a right. sequel or whatever and i and i miss those days yeah me too just, those let's are take some swings I, I agree completely that's what i wish that they would take yeah. from it too but um did we get close yeah, that's great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, man. We've got uh, Cal Michael. Hey. Uh, hey, man. So, um, oh, great. Something to remind me since <laughs> I've had a few drinks. Um, so, uh, if you, Mark Bernardin, had a, hi. hi, had a chance to do a Caprica esque remake. So set in that era, how would you do it, and how would you involve these two ladies in it? Because I believe that I believe that Caprica had a lot of hope, and um, I'm in love with the last episode. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, OK. So I will sort of answer your question. In that, I had been approached. I think I talked about the podcast before. But my, last time I was here. Last time you were here? Mm -hmm. I talked about the fact that, uh, that I had put together, I pitched a Battlestar um, reboot. Because um, I, I was approached by some executives who were like, we have the rights. We're going to do it. What's your take on it? And then the first thing that I said was I have to talk to Ron, like I need Ron's blessing even before I think about it. And so I ran into him and, uh, backstage at New York Comic Con. I'm like, listen, this is going to be super fucking weird, I know. But they asked me if I want to do this. I don't know if I should do it. I wanted to talk to you about it. I may never get the job. I don't know. But I don't even want to go down this road unless I know that you're cool with it. And he said, yeah, totally. I rebooted this from somebody else. You should be able to reboot this from me. Just don't touch the stuff that I made up. Like, leave me my Roslins, leave me my, you know, Athenas, leave me my, like, everything that was unique to this show, leave, leave alone. But you can have your guys Baltar, you can have your Apollo, you can have your, you know, Adama, all of that stuff that came from the 70s show, um, you can go for. Um, and so, but my take was, I, I didn't want to see any humanoid robots. I was like, I feel like that's the grand innovation of, of Ron's series was based somewhat out of budget. It was like, oh, we can't afford to do centurions all day long. What if they look like humans? And then what does that story-wise give you? Um, but I was like, I don't want that. I wanted to do a show about 
that we are surrounded by technology, that we have, we have surrendered so much of ourselves to the technology around us. I don't know how to get anywhere anymore. I used to remember every phone number of everybody I knew. I can't anymore. We have ceded so much of our own agency in the world to the technology around us, and then what if that technology goes bad? You know, and we start to see bits of it where like there's some Alexa in a house that's listening to shit that it shouldn't be listening to and giving information to places it shouldn't be giving it to. Um, but there's gonna be self-driving cars soon. There's gonna be robots that, that do surgery soon. There's gonna be drones delivering everything. The sky's gonna be clogged with robots. There's gonna be, gonna be, gonna be. And what happens if that all turns bad? And what happens if the world that's around us rebels against us? Um, that's the show that I had wanted to do. Um, and I think there's, there, was a, there was a character, she was a police captain named uh, Jane Adama, um, who I think Trisha would have been very nice for. I think she was the protagonist of the show. And she had two kids. Um, no, what was her name? Fuck, it wasn't Jane, it was something else. But she had two kids, Apollo and Athena, um, one of which went into the police, uh, the other of which became a doctor. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that you'd be awesome for the doctor. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I, can I chime in real quick? Hey, man. <laughs> it's your moment in the sun. So, you know, there's this mystery in regards to Starbuck in the last season. And I, I feel that there is such an opportunity there for time travel. And also with Six being a Cylon and being immortal, I think that's a grand opportunity as well. You should write it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, man, that's an awesome question, I think. Yeah, do we think? Mm -hmm. Awesome, man, thank you. Thank you. Did we answer it for you? Do you yeah, want more? No, Less? absolutely. Excellent. All right, we got one more question, then we choose the recipient of the grand, awesome, um, previously free public relations gift. Uh, <laughs> uh, Richard Soriano. Thank you. Hey, Richard. Hi. How are you, man? Uh, good. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Just to say, last year I binge watched, I was in the hospital last year, and I binge watched Battlestar Galactica. Just love the show. Love you guys. So, thank you. Um, my question is. Um, you know, as fans of science fiction and writers and actors of science fiction, um, what, uh, what scientific advances of today that excite you the most and what terrifies you? I just went hard on terrifies before. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of, well, this sort of excites me and terrifies me at the same time. I kind of like the idea of like another layer of traffic in LA, like hover, hover <laughs> vehicles. So it kind of excites me, but it also terrifies me because I don't think there's that many good drivers. They should only allow the good drivers up, up here. top. <laughs> <laughs> like you should have to pass a real hard test and like yeah. never have had a ticket for like 25 years or something no, crazy. Not the ticket part, but but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did I ever tell you guys when I, so a year ago, I bought a, a Mustang, right? Like I was, it was my fucking midlife crisis car. Like I'd always wanted one. Like I got a good ass job. I'm buying a fucking car. And so I drive Is up, it 5.0? I drive up to Trisha's house and she's like, hey, you got a Mustang? I'm like, yeah. Is it a 5.0? And I said, Did I say that? And I said, uh, no, it's a 2.4 EcoBoost. And you went, aww. Uh, <laughs> But it's got some giddy up, and she's like, "Yeah, I'm sure it does." <laughs> and so that's why she's I'm, got speeding tickets. I'm predictable, apparently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did you get the Did tickets. you get the big boy car? No, I got the little boy car. <laughs> Convertible. Aww. It's okay. Where are you gonna drive it in Los Angeles that fast? That's what I said. Oh, Thank you. There is no need good. for it. Um, so yeah, that purr. Talking, okay, so you had, I, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> so you had the, the bi-level traffic, you want the fifth element version of Los Angeles. Mm. Uh, what do you think? 
Um, I'm twofold on things that I think are absolutely amazing, but they both also terrify me. The, the advancements in medical technology are absolutely phenomenal. It's, you know, we're living longer than ever before. I, we've got more cures for incurable diseases. We, we have abilities to, you know, um, grow organs and save people with the terrible diseases. Um, um, but at this end, and, and on the same side of that, the advancements in technology for communication have absolutely revolutionized the way that we talk to each other and the way that we communicate. It's so easy now to to Skype your family, where sometimes you didn't see them for like five years, and now you pick up Skype and you feel like you see them every day. The downside of that is you don't see your family anymore and you feel like you see them every day, so you're not really connecting anymore. We're texting, we're, we're having these co like communication and conversations that don't really exist. Um, and then also, you know, um, I think that if people would just take care of themselves better, we wouldn't need all those advancements in medical <laughs> health, <laughs> so to a certain extent. So I think that, I think that, I don't know, both of those are amazing and they also both terrify me tremendously. Because we're uh, going to start growing people soon. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I remember reading an article, it must have been like seven or eight years ago, that there was some scientist at MIT or at some other place where they keep big brains who had like theoretically cracked faster than light travel. Like he didn't have the, the machinery to make it yet. It was all theoretical. It's like fucking Einstein shit where it's like, I don't, I believe this to be true, but I can't test it because we don't have the tech yet to build it. But that idea that somebody figured out Here's the formulas that we would need, here's the materials we might want which don't exist yet to do that thing that we've always wanted to do, which is travel the fucking stars. Mm -hmm. um, is so exciting to me. Uh, in, as a kid who grew up on Star Wars and Star Trek, like that seems to be where humanity is supposed to be. Granted, we will also fuck this place up before we get to do that, and there will be lots of reasons why we have to leave, but... Um, and I'm always fucking frightened to death every time I see some new video out of like Boston Dynamics where they've created some robot oh, that can like, I can open doors now. <laughs> like, look at these stairs, gallop, gallop, gallop. I'm like, fuck you. Like, you guys, you're the reason why we're gonna get like Cyberdyne systems. Like, there's gonna be Terminators because of you. Have you never seen the movies? We know how this goes. Stop doing this. <laughs> like I saw kind one of. the other day where it was like they basically built like N209 except they could do stairs and I'm like why would you do that you saw the movie the only reason he survives is because he can't go downstairs and you built fuck stairs I got this <laughs> so, yeah. clean your own damn house seriously right? like fuck I'm not wiping your ass anymore I can do stairs did you see they came out with one I just saw yesterday or today that that was actually made out of organic material of course it was, because they don't know that? But that's for sex toys. <laughs> <laughs> Science built first living robots from frog stem cells. Oh, good. Um, also for sex toys. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Every, every major technology they can't do is stairs. first used <laughs> for the wrong reasons. Like, <laughs> we built a camera, you guys. What should we do? Take pictures of, like, animals and flowers? Nah. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. How do we choose which video format to, to, to make a, the consumer uh, leader? Wide lens. <laughs> porn. <laughs> Literally, porn decided we would do VHS and not beta. Porn decided we would do Blu-ray and not HD DVD. They don't oh, like yeah. um, the high definition, though, do they? Oh, no, they're all about it. <laughs> really? It's For like reasons that escape the mind. Too... I don't know, like VR, like I want to go watch it in this. Squeegee on the way in. Uh, 40x for all of your home needs. <laughs> they, if they don't. <laughs> If they don't make that their commercial for the service now, then they've missed a golden opportunity. It's got 50 shades of 40X. Yes. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> Here's your 3D glasses. <laughs> Enjoy the and show. Your poncho. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is our robot. She will be serving you here. <laughs> uh, the, draft, the draft house is a totally different place now. <laughs> Uh, how's that for scary-ass technology? 
Sounds exciting. Fluids flying at you with the speed of sound. (laughs) (laughs) And then you gotta like neo your way out of it. Speaking of news, how excited are you for the next Matrix? I mean, I know we're not on that right now. I am crazy excited because um, I I had been a casual Yahya Abdul-Mateen fan Mm. and then saw him in Watchmen and I'm like, that motherfucker's gonna be in the Matrix? I hope he has his pants on because I don't want to feel bad about myself again. Did you watch any of Watchmen? So I have now watched Watchmen. Yes. We're on episode like six, seven. Okay. We're, we're going. How many you are there? Eight? Nine. All right. All right. So we got like two left. I'm sure we'll watch it when I get home tonight. Um, and it's fantastic. It's wonderful and super smart. Yeah. There's a scene, and I want to say it's episode eight. <gasps> So much fun! Should I just go straight to episode eight? I mean, you could because it's like, oh, yes. Oh, damn! Doctor Manhattan doesn't wear any pants. Yeah, well, she <laughs> takes out the fruit. It's like a, because that is is like a. It's oh, like yeah. a. That's foreshadowing. Very much so. It's it's eight shadowing. That's it's how long like it you is. pull it out, and I was like, <laughs> I pulled it out, and I went. My and my boyfriend's a total comic book dork. Um, no offense to anyone that is, because it's great. But um. He, uh, he it, but she pulled it out of like this thing, and I was like, "What's that?" And he was like, "Katie." Hey now. And he rewound it and paused it, and I was like, "Oh snap! <laughs> <laughs> Get it, girl." It's <laughs> <laughs> a foot long and then some. Um, but yeah, no, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a lot. Really? Of- like we get to see it? I would have him in Night Court. <laughs> His name is Bull for all kinds of reasons. <laughs> it's like pantsless Night Court. <laughs> the sexual chocolate, yeah. Why is everybody Winnie the Pooh in this Night Court? They got the shirts on and then there's nothing on the bottom. It's like, because. I'm the boss, stop. I'm the boss and gavels need to bend. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> Just a big. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, we're going home now. Jong <laughs> Jong. <laughs> <laughs> that is against the law, but totally in order. <laughs> oh, hey, did we fuck up that question, good for you? He's <laughs> like, I'm still standing here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here you go. Thank Hold you, out. Sir. There's going to be some good stuff at that movie theater soon. Yeah. <laughs> they just need right, to watch so, this so video. Who do we think uh, killed it the most with the question? Oh. We get, we get to choose. We get to choose, or should we do like audience? Um, y'all got to clap? I think that's clap? more fair audience. to do we audience. We should sign that, though, right? Yes, you guys okay, should we'll sign, sign it up. We should sign it on the front or on our photos? Uh, front or photos? Uh, both. both. Everywhere, every page. <laughs> Also, your social security number. <laughs> Blood type. All right, so uh, what were the questions? JC, do you remember the questions we had? We had uh, the Joker question. Okay, round of applause for Joker. All right. We had, uh, we had that last question. It was about the technology we're excited for and afraid Technology. Of. Okay. Why, uh, why did Battlestar hold up so well? And how many pockets? Oh, oh he yeah. kept his. Uh, what show have you auditioned for and didn't get, but we're happy about it? Okay. And then there was the Battlestar uh, reboot question. And yes, the, yeah, the prequel. I feel like it's, why does Battlestar hold up so well? Yeah. That sounded, I think that's the one. So uh, for whom was that question the... the Hey, there he is, Mr. Sanchez. And he, <laughs> he arrived at 3.30 this afternoon to sit right here, too. So. Wow, hot damn. What are those things? I don't know, what are these? Who brought these things? Oh, those are mine. Do we sign them? No, you can't keep them. They're actually gifts. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Involved 
in the podcast every now and then. There, there so is some, uh, uh, I thought, let's give the guys some cup coasters to put that wine on. Aww. So at least, at least the cats can try to get away. I'm here for the NAM show that is in Anaheim this week. And okay. this is my company, so I thought that would be appropriate on multiple levels. So enjoy the, uh, the cup coasters, please. Thank you. Thank you. And so these are vinyl coasters, www.atgr.nl from the Netherlands, yeah? Thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> and now I'm so fancy. Um, boys and girls, I think that's the end of an evening. Yeah? Did you guys have fun tonight? I cannot thank you enough for coming out. I cannot thank JC and the good folks here, the Scum and Villainy Cantina, for continuing to host this insanity on a semi-regular basis. And I cannot thank my co-hosts enough. Trisha Helfer and Katie Sackhoff. Oh, yay. Thank you so much for playing with thank me. You. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, guys. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Um, and so that is an episode of Black Man Beyond. Next week, uh, Kevin Smith is back in the hizzy. Uh, so on the 21st of January, he will be here with me, and I don't know what the fuck we're going to talk about, but we'll make it up as we go. Um, but for now, that is another episode. So come back next week, same fat time, same fat channel, smodcast.com or youtube.com slash Kevin Smith. Good night, everybody. Yeah.